Okay. So the Rules Committee will come to order. Um, as we begin what should be our final rules meeting of the year, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to touch on, I think, a lot of the things that we've accomplished during the 117th Congress. Um, I think we've made tremendous progress over the last two years. We enacted historic bipartisan laws to rebuild our infrastructure, uh, tighten gun safety, expand health care for veterans, protect victims of sexual misconduct, overhaul the Postal Service, enshrine same-sex and interracial marriage rights, uh, support Ukraine's defense against Russia's horrific war of aggression, and respond, respond to China's growing aggressiveness. House uh, and Senate uh, Democrats delivered big to help our country emerge from COVID crisis. We got shots in arms, continued critical relief for families, and safely reopened schools nationwide. On top, on top of all of that, this year we passed the most significant response to climate change in the country's history. We increased access to medical care for seniors, middle and lower income Americans, and enacted programs that will provide essential lifelines to millions. Uh, but despite all that we've pushed through uh, all to the, across the finish line, a few things remain. Last month, the Rules Committee held the first ever hearing on seating a Cherokee Nation delegate in the United States House of Representatives. Though a complicated issue, I personally believe that we need to find a way to honor our treaty obligations with the Cherokee and seat a delegate in the House. And I'm committed to working to make that happen in the next Congress. And I appreciate the members of this committee, especially my ranking member, uh, for agreeing to look at this issue seriously and try to find a way forward. Mr. Perlmutter's Safe Banking Act, which we're going to hear a little bit more about later, is another measure that we that should have made it over the finish line and signed into law. We ought to figure out how to harmonize federal and state cannabis law and give businesses that legally grow, market, or sell cannabis access to the banking system. It's another issue that I will continue to advocate for in the years ahead. Uh, and I know my friend, even though he will no longer be in Congress, will be uh, on all of our backs to make sure that we deliver. Um, something else that Congress needs to address is comprehensive immigration, including providing DREAMers and TPS recipients a path to citizenship. These young people who have known no other home than the United States deserve the chance to become American citizens. And Congress ought to find a way to make that happen. And we have in the House, on a number of occasions, voted on legislation to do just that, and other immigration uh, uh, measures as well. I mean, the re reality of the other body is that um, you need 60 votes to have a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, we need we lack 10 Republicans who will allow a vote to proceed on these measures. If they did, I think we would we would pass them. Um, it is that simple. And the expanded child tax credit um, that became law, law as part of the American Rescue Plan in 2021, I believe should be made permanent. Our chairwoman of the uh, Appropriations Committee, Mr. Loro, has been a champion of that issue for a long, long time. The enhanced benefit cut our country's child poverty rate in half and reduced hunger amongst children. It would be irresponsible not to continue a program that achieves so much good. So, you know, many of us have tried to bring our best to bring these measures to the floor, and we've had some success in passing them in the House uh, and been frustrated in the Senate, but we're not going to give up, and they will be remain top of mind in 2023. That said, we're about to consider and hopefully pass what will be meaningful, which what will be a meaningful appropriations package for fiscal year 2023. Before us today is Senate amendment to the House amendment to the Senate amendments to HR 2617, the Consolidated Appropriations Act for 2023. I want to congratulate House Appropriations Chair Deloro, Senate Appropriations Chair Leahy, and Senate Appropriations Vice Chair Shelby for their masterful leadership in crafting this bicameral, bipartisan government funding bill. Um, I'll leave it uh, to today's witnesses to talk about the specifics of this bill. I also want to acknowledge uh, Ranking Member Granger, uh, because I know um, all the work that you have put into the appropriations process. We may not all be in agreement at the end here, but I do want to th thank you as well uh, for um, the way you approach this this issue. And um, and I um, and, and again, this bill received broad bipartisan broad bipartisan support in the Senate including the votes of 16 uh, other uh, 17 Republicans, including the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. And, 
and we don't agree on anything. Um, so, uh, as always, uh, I, as I always say, it's difficult enough to get senators to agree on uh, where to go to lunch, let alone come together to, to pass the same pieces uh, of legislation. But many Senate Republicans knew that this package was a good bipartisan deal. I thank them for their willingness to work together and deliver it for the American people. Let me just close by saying, um, look, I don't, I don't love everything in this bill. Quite frankly, um, I find the, these endless increases in defense spending year after year to be appalling, especially with the challenges that we face here at home. Uh, we constantly hear from the other side that we don't have enough money to invest in the American people, and yet um, there always seems to be enough to invest in the next weapon system that the Pentagon doesn't even want or need. Um, yet here we are, uh, willing to come to the table to try to get the best deal that we can. Uh, we even negotiated this bill, this bill, a bipartisan agreement to permanently extend summer EBT for parents with children, which is a big deal. That's an extra forty dollars per child per month for struggling parents to feed their kids over the summer when hunger is often the worst. So I don't love the way we paid for it, quite frankly. Again, I, I regret the fact that they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, paying for this by going after the emergency EBT monies for a lot of struggling families. Uh, I guess that's the give and take of, negoti of negotiations, but we have to break the habit of taking from one program that helps poor people and, and, and putting it into another program. But, but in any event, look, I appreciate uh, all of uh, the efforts that went into this. I want to again thank Chairwoman DeLauro and her incredible staff for the countless hours, for the, for, for the endless conversations and discussions with people on both sides of the aisle um, for making this um, a reality. So having said that, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. With that, let me turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any comments that he wants to make. And before I before I do, let me also take this opportunity to thank Ranking Member Cole and all the members of this committee, Democrats and Republicans, for all that they have put up with uh, during this last session, and to the staff in particular. Again, I'm proud of the work that we have done here. We have had some very vigorous debates up here. Uh, we have disagreed on many things without being disagreeable. And I'm proud of the fact that through some really tough uh, issues that we have still maintained our collegiality and respect for one another. Um, and it's due in no small part to the ranking member, Mr. Cole, uh, who I think has a high opinion of this institution. Uh, and he sh demonstrates that every day with the way he conducts himself. So with that, let me yield to Mr. Cole. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I turn to my prepared remarks, let me do two things. Let me first uh, return the compliment to you. I appreciate uh, we haven't always agreed, and, and we're not supposed to always agree, but you have always been agreeable and have uh, worked diligently uh, with both sides of the aisle as we've done the appropriate work of this committee. Uh, you've led with great distinction and uh, have always treated us uh, respectfully and uh, included us appropriately in, in the deliberations of the committee. Um, I can't tell you that uh, I won't be happy that uh, or unhappy that the nature of the count on the votes may change here next year. Uh, but I hope to continue our personal friendship and our professional relationship. Uh, you've been a splendid chairman of this committee, just as you are a splendid member. And I always like to point out there's not very many people that started as a staffer on this committee, worked its way through the ranks, and ended up as chairman of the full committee. And good leaders I'm, get good tips. Well, I. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you, you have the admiration of each and every one of us on our side of the aisle, just as I know you do have of uh, your fellow Democrats on your side of the aisle. And we have navigated some very difficult waters. And uh, um, again, as you pointed out appropriately, your remarks have been able to do so in a way that uh, we've all maintained our friendship, we've all maintained our pride in the institution uh, in, which, in which we're all privileged to serve. And uh, I want to thank you for your splendid leadership. I think uh, the institution is uh, uh, deeply in your debt, and I regard you as a great institutionalist and a great defender of the prerogatives and, uh, and the powers and uh, uh, the majesty of the institution. And you should be very proud of your service, just as each and every one of us are proud of you. Uh, let me also uh, uh, mention, since you did in your opening remarks, I want to thank you for holding the hearing that you held 
uh, for where the Cherokee Nation uh, delegate issue is concerned. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on that issue. Uh, I don't regard tribal issues as Democrat or Republican. Uh, they really are, are exceptionally bipartisan, and they really get down to the tribal sovereignty and the federal trust responsibility and the importance of maintaining our treaty obligations. And I know that you uh, share that view, so uh, that's a, an area that we'll continue to work together. Um, again, thank you. Uh, we're here today with my two very favorite members. I'm also very pleased that your relationship will change uh, next year to some degree as well. <laughs> and, but I treasure getting to work with, with both of you. I don't think there's two finer individuals than our chairman and ranking member here. And uh, I've watched my friend, the ranking member, establish that relationship uh, with multiple chairmen of both our party and of your party, Mr. Chairman. And certainly the two individuals here represent the very best traditions of this institution and the very best traditions of the Appropriations Committee, where I'm privileged to serve uh, with both the chair and the ranking member and look forward to doing so again. Um, we're here today to discuss the Consolidated Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2023. Mr. Chairman, it's no secret that we are here under extraordinary circumstances. Just two days ago, the Senate introduced its amendment to H.R. 2617. Uh, the resulting bill encompasses 4,155 pages. It would take more than eight reams of paper to print out, and if you spent just one minute reading each page, it would take you just shy of 70 hours without breaks to read the whole thing. I raise those figures to make clear the blindingly obvious. There is absolutely no way any member in this body has had time to read and review a bill that is this long on this short of notice. Instead of following regular order to produce this bill, we've instead done the exact opposite. We are now considering a massive bill, largely written behind closed doors in the Senate, on very short notice. It will come as no surprise that many members will vote against this bill for that reason alone. Now, before I continue, I want to make it clear that my distaste for this process does not extend to Chair DeLora and Ranking Member Granger of the House Appropriations Committee. The House has operated throughout this process much differently than the Senate. Unlike the Senate, which couldn't even be bothered to pass a single bill out of committee the past two years, the House passed all 12 bills out of committee by the end of June and six of the 12 bills across the floor in July. Now, there was, of course, much in those 12 bills that I and most of my Republican colleagues disagreed with. And that's fine. The point is that in the House, we did follow regular order. The House bills passed out of the committee after notice, a markup, and an amendment process in which every member of the committee had an opportunity to propose new ideas. This is how the process should work. And it's unfortunate that our colleagues in the Senate did not see fit to do the same. Had they done so, we might not be in the position we are in today. Uh, and at the 11th hour, Having said all that, uh, from what I know of this bill, there's much in here that I support. An increase in defense spending in order to continue to position America's armed forces to meet any challenge around the world was a key priority of Republicans. I'm pleased that this bill provides that necessary increase. This increase in defense appropriations matches the authorized figures included in this year's NDAA, and is a substantial increase over President Biden's woefully inadequate budget request. On the non-defense side, there are also things I like in this bill. Uh, the National Institute of Health will receive a healthy $2.5 billion increase, which is critical to addressing pandemics in the future in a project that my friend, the chair, and I have worked on together over many, many years. Uh, the bill includes advanced funding for the Indian Health Service, which will also go a long way toward improving health outcomes across Indian country and substantial increases in other Native programs. And there are all, uh, these are all real improvements uh, to current funding levels. I'm also supportive of the supplemental funding for Ukraine and, frankly, would be supportive of that if it receives a separate vote. I personally think we should have separate votes on a defense package, a non-defense package, the Ukraine supplemental the disaster supplemental, and a number of other items. Such a course would give members the chance to weigh in on each of these separately. 
I suspect that many Republicans who will be voting no on the overall bill because of the poor process might vote to support the defense package or other supplemental packages. But at the end of the day, the fact remains that this bill is coming to us as one large package. And the fact remains that most members are not going to have the time to read or process a 4,000-page bill. And with the deadline looming, that leaves members of the House with a binary choice, take the bill or leave it. It's extremely unfortunate that we are being asked to take or leave a deal crafted mostly by the Senate and the majority in the House, especially one that is this long. One of the challenges with a bill this massive is that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, we don't truly know what's in it. We don't know what provisions are problematic. And we don't know how everything we are doing with today's legislation will affect the American people. For many members, that will be reason enough to vote no. The bill also has an additional problem. On the whole, it's been far too much. We've fallen into the classic mistake of adding a little to everything when we should be focusing our spending increases where they are most needed. In my mind, defense, border security, energy production, and pandemic preparedness are some of the most critical needs at this moment. Uh, beyond those priorities, we should be taking a hard look at everything else and identifying those areas uh, where we can uh, cut spending and reduce the inflation crisis. And this has been caused by the majority's reckless spending. Mr. Chairman, at the end of the day, we must get back to a place of regular order, and we have to ensure that we are wisely spending the tax dollars of hardworking Americans. Uh, unfortunately, today's bill does not measure up. And that's through, again, no fault of the chair or the ranking member of the House Appropriations Committee. But I hope in the future we can work together to somehow get the Senate to return to regular order so we can move these bills through in an appropriate way. And I look forward to working, to our, my, working with my friends, the chair and ranking member, both uh, for the balance of the year and, and uh, certainly uh, in the next uh, Congress to see that that happens. With that, Mr. Chairman, I again thank you. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I yield back. Thank you. Ranking Member Cole yields back, and I want to thank him for his opening. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses to provide testimony on Senate amendments to H.R. 2617, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger, we're delighted that you are here. Right. I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Chairwoman DeLauro. Is that on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee. I welcome the opportunity to appear before you to present the 2023 Omnibus Appropriations Bill. It's a package of 12 appropriations bills that make critical investments to help our communities and supplementals to provide disaster relief and to protect Ukraine. Also very pleased to be here with Ranking Member Granger as we try to move forward and create a path to respond to the needs of the country. The package before us includes $1.7 trillion in discretionary resources, including $858 billion in defense funding. That's equivalent to the authorized level in the recently enacted NDAA, and the highest level for non-defense funding ever, $800 million, a 9.3% increase from last year. These investments support our communities with the urgency they need. To fight inflation and rising costs, we are helping working families with the cost of living. We expand affordable early learning programs with $8 billion, a nearly $2 billion increase, childcare and development block grants. We include increases for Head Start, preschool development grants. We are investing in high poverty schools and students with disabilities with $18.4 billion for Title I uh, and $15.5 billion for the special education program. We expand access to higher education with a $500 increase to the maximum Pell Grant, and we support minority students, uh, we start students at minority serving institutions. We expand home ownership opportunities for families trying to own a home. Our bills do this while creating better paying jobs and protecting our workers. Specifically, the legislation before us increases funding for the National Labor Relations Board for the first time since 2010 to $299 million 
a $25 million increase to protect workers' rights to collective bargaining. We strengthen high-quality job training and apprenticeship programs, put people to work rebuilding our infrastructure, protecting our environment, and preserving our advanced manufacturing base, keeping our nation competitive and investing in economic development of distressed communities and helping small businesses and entrepreneurs accept the capital, access the capital they need, all keys to our economic future. We provide a lifeline to families and communities in need by helping to meet their basic needs. We support nutrition assistance at home and abroad, including record high level funding for the Food for Peace and the McGovern Dole program. We strengthen housing assistance by creating over 21,000 affordable housing units for struggling families, veterans, survivors who have fleed domestic violence. We provide $800 million, a much needed increase of $650 million for the Migrant Shelter and Services Program, formerly the Emergency Food and Shelter Humanitarian Program. We include $3.5 billion in discretionary funding for the Food, uh, Food and Drug Administration. That's an increase of $226 million to address the opioid crisis and the medical supply chain issues. We fight health disparities. We focus on the health of our veterans who deserve and who have earned our support with a record $118.7 billion for VA medical care. And we provide advanced appropriations for the Indian Health Service, which I know is a top priority for the ranking member of this committee. These bills also focus on keeping our nation and our community safe, including the strong increases for the Department of Defense that will protect our national security, strengthen our ability to counter China and other near-peer adversaries. We also do this by investing in our service members, local law enforcement, cybersecurity, and gun violence prevention efforts, all while simultaneously strengthening diplomacy and global development. And we make investments to battle climate change with environmental enforcement and environmental justice efforts and investing in clean energy and climate science. And for the second year in a row, after a decade without this funding, Ten of these bills include community projects, including from many, many of us around this table on both sides of the aisle to strengthen the economic development of our communities and directly meet the needs of our constituents. Personally, I am thrilled that we were able to include funding to strengthen this body and grow the opportunity for all who work here. This includes increased funding for members' security allowance funds to create a house child care subsidy program and expansion of the student loan program. We respond to pressing needs by also including $27 billion in urgently needed support to help communities rebuild from recent natural disasters and extreme weather events. And as Putin continues to commit war crimes and doubles down on his ruthless attack, we provide $45 billion to support the Ukrainian people and defend global democracy. President Zelensky made it clear to us yesterday that they desperately need our continued support. And we all cheered him last evening. In his words, and I quote, this struggle will define what world our children and our grandchildren will live in. Ukraine's struggle is democracy's struggle. We stood and we clapped when he told us last night that, quote, our money is not charity. It is an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way, end quote. Because it is. This funding has the power to save lives and to protect democracy. We have no other choice. While we make critical investments in these bills, they are not perfect. There is much more I wish we could have done, including increased funding for Title X and other family planning programs in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Women are and will continue to suffer until we do more to help them gain access to essential health care services. I'm deeply disappointed we were not able to increase this funding, but I'm committed and will continue to wage the battle for increased resources for women's health. The bill is, however, a bipartisan compromise. We have proven that we can and that we must continue working together for hardworking people everywhere. I am proud of this bill 
and I urge all of my colleagues to support it. And I respectfully request an appropriate rule for floor consideration of this legislation and look forward to answering any questions. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Granger. Welcome. Just make, is, your, welcome. is your mic on? Just make, make sure your mic's on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole for allowing me to testify on H.R. 2617, an omnibus appropriation package to fund the government to the end of the fiscal year. I'm concerned about the size and scope of the package. It totals almost $2 trillion, and it comes after nearly $3 trillion of spending was pushed through this Congress. That's $3 trillion of enacted, completely out, enacted completely outside of the normal process. Overall, this record high spending was roughly twice the amount of funding in yearly appropriations <coughs> bills and has been a key driver of our historic inflation. Instead of reflecting the economic realities we face, the package of bills before us represents more spending for accounts that have already received large increases. We can't continue to spend at this rate on these extravagant social programs. I'm going to vote no when this bill comes before the floor. I thank you for allowing me to testify. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. I appreciate both of you being here. And, uh, and again, I appreciate all the work that you have done throughout this session. Um, I uh, will yield to Mr. Cole. Well, just quickly, uh, uh, I appreciate the work, too, since I sat in most of those committee meeting hearings, as my friend from California uh, did as well. And um, I will tell you, while uh, we certainly didn't agree with everything, I certainly agreed with the process that our committee operated by. The fact that each one of these bills came before our committee, that every member of the committee was given an opportunity to offer amendments, to participate in debate, to ask tough questions. Uh, the fact that we moved six of them across the floor. Frankly, I think uh, part of the reason perhaps that the other six didn't get across the floor is the dysfunction on the other side of the rotunda. It's hard for us to do our job when the Senate is doing any of its job at all. Uh, and uh, again, I think uh, uh, had these vote bills all come individually, uh, you know, in the normal process that uh, used to mark how we did operate in this institution, certainly when I arrived here, um, is uh, a, a driver of some of the polarization that's taken place. When you can't engage in give and take, uh, then I think we end up this way. And, and again, I put that blame squarely on the United States Senate, not on uh, uh, either of our two witnesses, and frankly, not on this institution. It's operated largely the way it should, but uh, uh, the requirement is that the other body do the same, and then once it's passed its bills out, uh, we sit down and have an opportunity to deal with them individually in, in reasonably sized chunks with adequate time for everybody to have an opportunity to then participate that's not on the Appropriation Committee. Uh, that hadn't happened, uh, and it hadn't happened because of our, our chair or ranking member. It's happened because the Senate chose not to do that for whatever reason. Um, and we simply can't continue to operate this way. Uh, the pushback uh, on our side, and I suspect with due respect to your side or the Democratic side as well, uh, is because members are being shut out of the process. Uh, and uh, that's not going to continue to work well. So, uh, again, I appreciate the hard work. Uh, I certainly know the long hours on the Appropriations Committee were put in and put in successfully to produce a product for the House to consider. Uh, I regret we didn't have a comparable effort on the other side of the rotunda, and I think that is a major impediment to the passage of the legislation. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mrs. Torres. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you both, um, Chairwoman and Ranking Member, for being here. Um, I do have the distinct honor, along with Ranking Member Cole and Congressman Reschenthaler, to be um, one of three uh, members that sit both on the Rules Committee and on the Appropriations Committee. So we really don't have a life. We work, uh, you know, day and night. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, 
your committee is truly um, an honor to be on that committee because so much that gets done, not, not just for um, you know, one individual member or a few individual members or one party or the other, but for Americans throughout the country. And I, for one, I'm very, very proud of the work um, that we have done with, if I may add, um, Mr. Chairman, to remind the general public that um, we have moved legislation, milestones that we never thought could be accomplished in a two-year um, Congress. And we did that with, at best, a four-plus member majority. And at its worst, we had a two- or three-member uh, majority with a 50-50 deadlock Senate. Um, it, it's a miracle that we did as much um, as we did putting money into the pockets of hardworking families that were struggling um, through this recession, through the pandemic, um, ensuring that our infrastructure was a focus for uh, future generations, and we invested money in that. We invested in good jobs, bringing back manufacturing um, to the United States, which makes me very, very proud because I hope that my district will uh, receive a lot of that uh, money. You know, we're here today to continue um, to consider this Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, which funds programs that are important um, to my constituents as well as to all the American people. And as a member of the Appropriations Committee, um, I will continue to work hard alongside both of you to ensure that we continue to deliver for the American people. But um, today, I want to highlight a few things that I'm very proud of, and that's you know, 15 of my community projects request, um, totaling uh, more than $19 million for our local communities in the Inland Empire were included in that. These critical investments will help create jobs with better pay, make us safer, um, strengthen our communities, and address California's drought. I also want to thank my fellow appropriators for their leadership in getting these <coughs> bills to the finish line. With all that said, however, I am extremely disappointed um, that the Senate, the Senate has failed to act yet again on a solution for deferred action for childhood arrivals, or DACA. We know that there are more than 610,000 DACA recipients living in the U.S. We also know that this program is in jeopardy from a very conservative court. Um, next year, and DREAMers consistently face attacks from, from colleagues um, uh, uh, on the other side of the aisle and just general you know, attacks from people that um, don't see them as American, as the Americans that they are. Um, and they are just as Americans as all of us, except in paper. Um, I don't understand why these young uh, men and women who the only country that they know is the United States of America um, because they were here at a very young age. I don't understand uh, why it has been impossible to move legislation to protect them. Um, Democrats have twice passed the Dream and Promise Act out of the House and sent it to the Senate with bipartisan support because we have had some Republican support um, on those bills not just this Congress, but in previous Congresses. Um, but the Senate, again, has failed to act on those, um, on those agreements and those bills. For all of the concerns over border security, the Homeland Security funding bill includes billions. Let me say that again. It includes billions of dollars for border security. However, um, some of my colleagues still don't want to act because they don't see that um, that is enough. Um, let me remind everyone again that we are talking about a group of people that are our neighbors. Um, they are you know, our co-workers, our colleagues, um, our classmates who wake up every single day and contribute to this country. Many of them were working on the front lines during this pandemic and saved our lives um, through nursing um, programs that they participated in, um, and just being every single day showing up to work um, to ensure that the rest of us could stay home um, and, and survive this pandemic. That's why I'm proud to co-sponsor a, um, 
an amendment that uh, is being proposed by my colleague, uh, Representative Sylvia Garcia. This amendment will protect DREAMers and offer a pathway to citizenship for them. I understand and I am uh, disappointed that um, we have an opportunity to um, present this amendment, offer it, and we have to withdraw it because we have to get this, these bills passed. Um, but I want to remind everyone, and I think we all want to be on record, um, that we will, not we will not continue to accept you know, inaction for DREAMers, and that we are prepared on day one uh, in the next Congress to continue to push for um, an answer for some relief for these young people that are part of our families. They deserve better. They are taxpayers. You know, we often talk about um, being taxpayers without representation. <clears throat> Truly, these young Americans are taxpayers that haven't had the representation because they simply cannot get legal status. The process that we have isn't working. It hasn't been working. Um, and it's never going to work for them if we continue down the road where we are now. So I want to thank my colleagues that are here from CHC and the others that are watching tonight. Um, and I know that all of us will continue to work together as a bigger caucus um, next year to ensure that we get this legislation passed. And with the Senate having a one-member majority, maybe we will succeed. And I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I do want to thank our witnesses for being with us today and particularly want to thank Ranking Member Granger because I know how hard you have worked, how important this is to you, and I share your disappointment with where we are today and the, and the product that is before us. That's not because you haven't tried, because you really have, and, and uh, at least those of us on this side of the dais are very appreciative of your efforts to try to get us something that would be at, at least meaningful that, that we could show the American people that we're willing to do their work. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I do just have to say, uh, um, I spent the last several days dealing with a, a family health crisis, and while things seem to be improving now, and I am very grateful for the work of doctors and nurses who work long and late hours and work very hard in all kinds of weather, and never mind the fact that uh, most people are spending time with their holidays, they've still got to be on the job. But then once again, we find ourselves in a December where our nation's physicians are facing a substantial reduction in their, in their reimbursements in Medicare. The physician's fee schedule, the uh, PAYGO rules, the sequester that was used to help fund the American Rescue Plan two years ago, all of those in aggregate add up to about a 9% reduction in, in physician reimbursement. And this is in a background of an 8 or 9% inflation rate. So it is virtually impossible for these doctors and nurses on whom we depend every single day it's impossible for them to, to maintain their practices. I, I do recognize that there was a modest increase in, in this bill of 2%, but it does nothing to fill the uh, 7 or 8% hole that was left in the physician's fee schedule and the, and the, uh, and the sequester. And then, of course, the baseline inflation rate affects the, uh, how they are able to... Uh, cash flow their offices as well. So it's extremely disappointing that with spending $1.7 trillion, you couldn't throw a little bit of a lifeline to the nation's physicians and nurses who have gotten us through this uh, once in a hundred year health crisis that we've just been through. And look, many of us are, are, are facing problems from the so-called triple-demic right now and the shortages that are occurring on our drugstore shelves it seems like we could have delivered a better product. So I, again, want to thank Ranking Member Granger because I know she worked very hard on this. I know she listened to all of the concerns that were brought to her from the Doctors' Caucus. Uh, we will work on this next year. We will make a, a, a significant attempt to try to get this right. But unfortunately, it, it leads to some bleak days 
for the nation's physicians coming going forward. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time, and I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burgess, and just know we're you're, you and your family are in our prayers, and we hope um, everything goes well. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, just a couple comments, and then I've got some amendments I'll offer at the uh, end of this hearing. And I appreciate the, the work that you two have done. Um, it's a gigantic piece of legislation. Uh, for me, there's two glaring omissions, and both of you will be familiar with them. One is the Safe Banking Act, which I've been working on a lo long time, as have a lot of us. I mean, we passed it with 321 votes several times. We passed it to the Senate seven times to watch it go nowhere, uh, under Democrats and Republicans. So the blame goes across both, both sides. I remember uh, somebody that several of you have served with, I did, Wayne Allard, he would always say, you know, the real problem isn't the Republicans or the Democrats, it's the other house. And from my point of view, that, that has turned out to be true. And just since this is sort of going to be my last hearing, I'm just going to say as a general proposition, just watching the chess game as to who gets what and how, what happens, um, I feel like they've played the game by delay up to a Christmas holiday, and you jam it down the House members' throats. And so it puts a lot of power into the Senate and into our leadership because it becomes the four corners making final decisions about everything. Obviously, as chairs, you two played uh, a role, a chair and ranking member, and you know the positions will ch change next year. But we end up taking most of what the Senate wants us to have, and we take what the four corners want us to have. And as somebody, you know, I'm on a lot of committees. So I'm in the mix on a lot of things. but. When it finally comes push to shove, it's okay. We got Christmas coming up on Sunday, and we've got a terrible storm coming. Take it or leave it, as Mr. Cole was saying. And so there are two glaring omissions. I'm going to ask you just a couple of factual questions. Um, do you, the, the other glaring omission is a cost of living adjustment, okay? And just being part of the, of the crowd, I know that for many of us, we're strained uh, by the $174,000, which is a nice number, but you take into consideration two homes, and that was the number that we had in 2009, and we still have that today. So let me just give you some numbers and see if you two disagree with me. So in 2009, we had a uh, gross domestic product of $14.2 trillion. Today it's $26 trillion, an increase of 85%. And if, in fact, our COLA were based on that GDP, we would be paid an additional $147,000 for a total of $321,000. So that, okay, let's chuck that one. Do either of you know what our base defense budget was in 2009? $513 billion. Now, we had a, we had a supplemental because we were in Iraq and Afghanistan in a pretty big way, but we are $513 billion. Our base budget this year, I think, is $813 billion with certain amount of supplemental for Ukraine and, and some other things on top of that. That's a gain of 63% or some uh, 109,000, which would put us at $283,000 if we kept pace with the defense budget in terms of our salary. Finally, uh, did you take either of you take into consideration just the uh, increase in the consumer price index in this uh, last year as part of our budgeting process. Mr. Perlmutter, I made the case over and over again, and it wasn't specific to the issue that you are uh, speaking about, um, but the important underlying concept, I believe, is that 
uh, while there was, uh, overall there was inflation. And inflation exists on the defense uh, side of the equation, and inflation exists on the non-defense side of the equation. Um, I fought that battle, and I think we tried to do what we needed to do uh, with the pushing and the shoving and the delaying and all that you speak about in terms of trying to, uh, if, if you will, deal with the issue of parity in finance. And that was uh, opposed. So we were able to do what we could, and in a whole variety of areas, and I may see Dr. Burgess spoke about uh, health care, et cetera. Um, but the rate of inflation, as was applied to the defense budget, and I represent a very defense-dependent state, that it was not the same rate that was applied to the non-defense side of the budget. Um, that being said, I think we did remarkably well with what we were able to do to make sure that the issues on the non-defense side of the budget were addressed uh, in a uh, robust way. And I appreciate that. I guess where I'm going, obviously, is to our, the cost of living adjustment so between 2009 and today, it's 33% increase in costs across the board, in which case we would be, we, on top of $174,000, would be entitled to a $58,000 increase, which is precisely where the judges will be on January 1st. And so both of you are familiar that in, back in 2009, our salaries in the U.S. District Court judges were the same. Am I mistaken, or do you remember that? Okay, well, they were. And then we stopped, no, stopped, provi that, then then we stopped providing ourselves COLA, and we stopped them for, for, from receiving cost of living adjustments. They sued us, saying, you are diminishing our salaries, you can't do that, mm -hmm. and they won. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be a $233,000 starting January 1st, and we're still at 174. Now, I say this not that we deserve sympathy in this place, and a lot of people think we're overpaid. They think we're overpaid at zero dollars, okay? I mean, it's just what it is. But on the other hand, there are two things that I think all of us as policymakers have to consider, and more than that, but two, for sure. One, if you're a middle-class American, you got kids, you know, put them through college, you want to save something for your future, it's hard to do it living in two places at once and paying for those kinds of things as inflation has increased and, and salaries not being commensurate. So you really make it for either very rich people or somebody who's never had a job before, and this is the, something that really is beneficial to them. Now, you know, Mrs. McGillicuddy lives down the street from me. is going, oh, Ed, you make too much money anyway. But just, I'm not going to be here more than another day or two and just want to speak reality. And the other thing that I think from an institutional standpoint that we must consider is that when you stress people financially, they can do dumb things. Not to say anybody has, but as a bankruptcy lawyer or somebody who represented a lot of individuals, desperate people do desperate things. And I don't want us, I don't want us to find ourselves because we've been so afraid that Mrs. McGillicuddy's going to vote against us because got a cost of living adjustment for the first time in 14 years that something is wrong. So... I guess my question to you as, as the folks who, who worked on this bill, Section 6 of the bill, um, uh, of course I've lost it, um, Section 6, page, Division A, it's the, it says, um, let me see if I can. had it. No, no, 
Oh, here I got it. It basically strikes the call again. It just did there was there any discussion about that? It has been indicated through a number of conversations, especially as it concerns the appropriations bill. In order to get the appropriations bill signed by the President of the United States and keep the government functioning, one has to have bicameral and bipartisan support to be able to move forward. By the way, I was first going to say, um, in all sincerity, it's hard to think about your being here for only a few more days. And I mean that well, very, very, very sincerely. Thank you. You're very you know, kind. We've, we've <laughs> gone back a long time and came out to your district many, many years ago and so forth. Uh, but the nature of this issue is that uh, on all of the issues, that we face here is that it must be bipartisan and it must be bicameral in order for us to be able to proceed. In the absence of that, we cannot proceed. And so then that brings me to the 27th Amendment. 27th Amendment says we cannot vary our salaries without there being an intervening election. And in the 1989 Ethics Reform Act, we set down a specific formula that says that members of Congress, the judges at that time too, are entitled to a cost of living adjustment because they can't take honoraria, can't work outside of the House, uh, out of, outside of Congress, and, but you're going to get a steady cost of living adjustment. And by denying the cost of living adjustments, which is in Section 6, Division A, without there having been an intervening election, the 27th Amendment was violated because in this particular past year, we had probably an 8% um, cost of living increase, mm -hmm. which was not recognized in that section. Now, I'm talking a lot about salaries for us. And that sure is not going to be a very, you know, sexy um, conversation for Mrs. McGillicuddy in my neighborhood. But on the other hand, we've got to stop uh, demeaning ourselves. I mean, I know when I leave here, I'm going to make a lot more than I'm making here, you know, without divulging any secrets. It's just what it is. We don't want to, as public servants, we don't want to get rich. We're not here to get rich. We want to make good policy for all those reasons that, Ms. DeLauro, you mentioned, all those good things that are in that bill. Uh, but you don't want to go broke in the process either by having to live in two different places. And so with that, I'm going to offer some amendments to strike Section 6 of the legislation. And I understand you know, the votes may not be here on this committee. It's not going to be a popular vote. I may have to withdraw it and not take the vote. Mm -hmm. But we have certain constitutional responsibilities to us as part of this institution. And I'm going to do that. I'm, obviously, I'm going to uh, move to add safe banking uh, to this bill. And I know that we're going to do a closed rule, or that's what's going to be offered. Uh, supposedly, the Senate said you know, they weren't going to take up any amendments, which they did. And we have to consider those today. So um, I won't have that much to say at the end when I get done. So, but I am, because uh, now you know what I'm going to do. Look at, uh, look at how sympathetic Weird. everybody is. I put Tom Cole to sleep. <laughs> um, but I really, as members of this Congress, oh, I think we've got to treat ourselves fairly. And even though we know we're going to get pushed back for the, for the sake of the institution and making sure that people uh, are not stressed, because I can tell you how many people have come up to me to talk about this. This is not a pleasant conversation for anybody to say, I'm stressed out. I mean, it's really hard to make it work here. So it isn't something that's front and center all the time, but I think as members, we've got to consider that when the, when the appropriations. And maybe it should never get enough votes. And then the question is, what kind of people are you going to get here? With that, I yield back.
I thank the gentleman, and now I know my, why my wife always says, I love Ed Perlmutter. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, I yield to the gentleman uh, from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And Mr. Perlmutter, I, don't, I can't speak for Mr. Cole, but I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I just want to uh, thank uh, the chairwoman, my ranking member, for all the hard work you put in. Uh, we all tr truly appreciate it. I want to associate my remarks with the ranking member. And for the last time, I think I'm going to be able to do this. I'm going to associate my remarks with Mr. Perlmutter. I think that's the last time I can do it. So thank you. I've got, um, I've got a lot to say. I've got a lot of questions. But because I've got respect for my colleagues, I'm just going to yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Scanlon. Hi. Thank you. I oh. hope you can hear me. Is that coming through? Yes. OK. Um, I did just want to thank the chairwoman and the ranking member for all of their work. Obviously, this has not been um, an easy process. I also wanted to take my turn to um, be unhappy with the Senate because the Senate version coming back to us has a lower number for the Legal Services Corporation. It has historically been funded. We're still funding legal service for about 1970s levels account for inflation to get a modest increase through the house this year. I wish we would have would be voting on that as we go, um, have this bill proceed. But um, other than that, to thank our appropriators for doing the job so well that I would yield back. Thank you. And Mr. Raskin, I didn't I, I didn't uh, forget you. You just were cut off my screen. So I'm going to go to Ms. Fishback and then go to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I'd just like to associate myself with the remarks of our ranking member, and with that, I'll yield back. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Raskin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, thank Chairwoman Delora for her um, really extraordinary and heroic work on this legislation. And there's a lot of stuff that I really love that's in here. But um, again, out of uh, respect for a colleague's time, I won't get into it. But I also do want to agree with uh, Ms. Delora, who said it would be uh, hard to think of um, Mr. Perlmutter even spending a few more days with us. And so other than that, I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, add my voice of thanks to uh, Chairwoman uh, DeLauro. I, um, although Ms. Torres understandably just acknowledged three members, I actually am a member of the Appropriations Committee. Um, they were so... I mean, there were. I didn't get to vote on any of it because they were already done by the time I was appointed. So um, that's how much further ahead of this uh, we were uh, than the United States Senate to Mr. Cole's uh, point and, and the point that others have made. But I do want to thank the appropriators for the hard work. I know this is uh, uh, a lot of time, a lot of energy. Um, with similar duty to being on the rule. A lot of time and a lot of energy. And so I uh, want to agree with Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, I think the question of what we value, and I don't, I've not had the privilege of meeting Mrs. McGillicuddy, but I understand his point. Um, but if you're not going to invest in something and you're not going to continue to uh, make sure that uh, people are competent, at least in a just way, uh, then the influences around us and in Washington, also to Mr. Perlmutter's point, there are a lot of people uh, who make, uh, you know, two, three, four times uh, uh, what legislators make once they leave service. And to me, that creates a temptation. It also indicates uh, how much we value these jobs. Maybe uh, some members come uh, who have uh, vast resources, and this is uh, not an issue. But if you want to get average American Congress being able to uh, uh, perhaps stop their career midterm and come back to it at some point or not, uh, I think uh, you have to uh, adequately compensate them, uh, and I think uh, it's a huge mistake that we are not, uh, and that we continue to freeze this. And uh, you know, for me, um, it's not an issue, but I think for some of the younger members who come with young family members, young children, uh, I think this is something that Congress needs to do if we're going to attract uh, the best of the brightest. Uh, but again, thank you to the appropriators, and uh, I yield back. Thank you very much. I don't Mr. Desanya, I don't see him, but Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to reiterate my appreciation and admiration
for Chairwoman Deloro and um, just say, you know, we've had, we had an omnibus last year and this year. They were a little late, but they arrived fully funding the government without a government shutdown, with community projects that are helping all of our communities, and they have gotten bipartisan support in the Senate. And I think that that is an extraordinary accomplishment, and I think um, Chair DeLauro deserves our appreciation and our respect for accomplishing that in this session. Um, I also just want to make a couple of other points. I want to agree um, with Congresswoman Torres that the fact that this package did not include our DREAMers, and that includes um, DACA recipients and our documented DREAMers, who are victims of a broken immigration system, is, is really a tremendous disappointment in this Congress and should be something that's a bipartisan priority. I also want to point out that this um, omnibus includes the Electoral Count Act, which is probably one of the greatest investments in our domestic democracy while we are also investing in democracy in Ukraine. And the fact that that was done in a bipartisan way is a huge accomplishment for this Congress. Um, I, and then personally, as a freshman who has been learning the um, community project process, I did do it as a state legislator, on behalf of the citizens of Wake County, North Carolina, we thank you for funding mental health, affordable housing, small businesses, and the environment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions of this panel? Do you, you guys want to say anything else? but also to understand that there is an additional uh, legal search in the disaster uh, uh, um, supplemental. There's legal services. Legal Services Corporation is $20 million is provided for emergency legal assistance to underserved individuals and families impacted by natural disasters. So there was a recognition of that in addition and of, uh, to the regular appropriation. Look, the, uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, there, look, there are 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate. Uh, we would all write the end-of-year appropriations bill differently from one another. We all have uh, different priorities. But at the end of the day, I think what we're faced with now is when you weigh all the equities, when you look at everything that is there, on balance, um, is this worth supporting or is it not? Um, from my perspective, it is. Some of my colleagues say it isn't. I mean, people are going to have to make that decision. Uh, but I do again want to emphasize our gratitude to uh, ch you, Chairwoman DeLauro, and your team for getting us to this point. Uh, I also want to thank Ranking Member Granger and her staff. Again, we have all the appropriations bills that Mr. Cole referred to that came through this committee. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you both, uh, and, um, and not just for what you produce, but for the manner in which you conduct yourself. I mean, we are living in a time when everybody's yelling at everybody and pointing fingers and it's such polarization. We may not all agree on where we are right now, but the tone here is something that I think needs to be replicated um, in, with other legislation as well. I mean, we have to get things done. Get, getting stuff done should be our priority, and, um, and so we look forward to working with you in the future. But there are no other questions, so you are free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Jay. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so I want to call, we have some other witnesses here, uh, uh, Representative Garcia, Representative Correa, Representative Tenney. Uh, you're more than welcome to come up to the table. And
you're, you're more than welcome to pull up a chair. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, uh, Representative Garcia, you may begin. Is red, red doesn't mean it's on. Good. Yeah. I'm used to Fair green enough. being on. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about the amendment that, that I put forward on protections for our dreamers uh, on this omnibus bill. Uh, as you noted, and thank you, I'm heartened by the fact that you and the committee um, recognize that this was unfinished business uh, this session. Uh, but I'm here today to express my utmost support for DREAMers around the country. I introduced this amendment seeking to codify legal protections for DREAMers in the omnibus, and I want to explain why. It is now a time of now or never for DREAMers. Those 600,000 plus that my colleague, Representative Torres, mentioned, it's almost a do or die. They are hanging by a thread. If Congress does not act now, the courts will end DACA as soon as next year. If DACA ends, thousands will lose their jobs, impacting labor market sectors already experiencing shortages, such as healthcare, education, service industries, food production, and more. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus has been relentless in our fight to secure a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers. We have twice, twice passed the Dream and Promise Act out of the House and sent it to the Senate with bipartisan support. Ultimately, Senate Republicans have let our dreamers down once again. You said earlier that it takes 60 over there to agree to get a cup of coffee. Well, in this case, 75% of Americans agree that we need to get that coffee and they need the dreamers there helping us side by side, drinking that coffee, making that coffee, harvesting that coffee, selling that coffee, because we are part of the American dream. My amendment is exact same language as that already passed in the Dream and Promise Act. No changes, exact. We've already acted on it, it's simple. To the hundreds and thousands of dreamers and their families, we will not rest until we deliver a pathway to citizenship and keep our families together. Mr. Chairman, you know, I'm often asked what kind of Democrat I am, and I always say a Matthew Democrat, because I truly believe that helping dreamers continues what Matthew tells us to do. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And it's not only time to welcome our dreamers, but to make sure they stay here and thrive and reach their full potential. We must help our dreamers. We must not give up, and we will never give up. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Uh, I'm also here in support of this uh, amendment for support of the dreamers. Uh, me be brief. We all know about this issue. Just to emphasize, 80 percent of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, support a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. This is not an issue about immigrants. This is an issue about America and keeping America strong. Dreamers are nurses, police officers, firefighters. They work in all sectors of our economy. They're also soldiers. In my district, young man, Jose Angel Garibay, first American soldier to make the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq at the age of 21. He was a dreamer. He volunteered for the Marines, made the ultimate sacrifice, and we made him an American citizen posthumously. That's a dreamer. Today, we have many dreamers in the military. What do you tell them when the court system rule against them? They continue to be in limbo. That's a dreamer, and those are our dreamers. To be a dreamer, as you know, you have to obey the law. You cannot have a criminal record. You have to have a job, pay taxes. Our economy needs dreamers. I probably represent the largest number of dreamers in the country. I represent Orange County. If you took Orange County, we'd be 32nd largest economy in the world. Dreamers, immigrants are part of that economic miracle, Orange County, California. I would just say, let's stop using dreamers as a political piñata. Let's rescue these good taxpayers, not immigrants, 
taxpayers from the political whims of our economic political system. Give them an opportunity. No, actually, give them the opportunity to earn a pathway to citizenship. Let's do what's right. In America, we're always just, and we're always looking to do what's right in the eyes of God. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Representative Tenney. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern, and also Ranking Member Cole. Uh, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to testify about this, the, uh, this amendment in the underlying bill, which was uh, would add the text of the Susan Muffley Act of 2022 to the FY23 omnibus appropriations package. In 2009, more than 20,000 Delphi salaried retirees lost the full value of their retirement benefits in the aftermath of the General Motors bailout. As part of its 2009 bankruptcy agreement, the Delphi Corporation, a subsidiary of GM, surrendered its pension obligations to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. The Obama administration then worked behind closed doors with union leaders to guarantee union workers full pension benefits while slashing the pensions promised to 20,000 non-unionized salaried staff. After a decade of exhausting every avenue in the judicial system, the Delphi salaried uh, retirees are relying on Congress to restore their pension plans. To do so, Congressman Kildee and Congressman Turner introduced the bipartisan Susan Muffley Act to restore the Delphi salaried retirees' pension plan with back pay. I want to take a moment to recognize the individual this bill is named after, Susan Muffley, Ms. Muffley's husband, Dave, worked for Delphi for 31 years and lost the full value of his pension in 2009. With this unexpected and burdensome change in their economic status, Mrs. Muffley avoided seeing her doctor despite ongoing illnesses. And unfortunately, she died, uh, was later diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and died in 2012. What is even more tragic about Ms. Muffley's story is this is not unique. I did a full town hall with hundreds of members who all have ex had similar experiences. There are thousands of stories, as I said, just like this, including all over western central New York uh, and former Delphi employees whose pensions were slashed, launching them into economic hardship. They received but a fraction of their hard-earned money. Like most of the committee, including Chair McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, I was honored to support the passage of the Susan Muffley Act when it passed the House of Representatives in July. I'm disappointed this legislation never received a vote in our favorite place, the U.S. Senate. Uh, and I was also disappointed that it was not in our one-year appropriations package, despite our strong bipartisan advocacy. Uh, reversing this injustice would be life-changing for so many of our constituents and all the Delphi salaried employees across the country whose personal investments and benefits were actually stripped away. While I understand my amendment will likely be ruled out of order, I urge you on the powerful rules committee to deem this amendment in order and help the Delphi salaried ret retirees restore their full pension benefits. After 13 years of fighting, it would be a travesty if they had to start back at square one. But before I yield back, I just want to thank uh, Representatives Kildee, Turner, and those of you who, who uh, also uh, joined in supporting this uh, for co-leading my amendment and also for introducing the Susan Muffley Act this year. It's been an honor to fight on their behalf. And I just want to also a special thank you to Rick Straczynski and others, advocates from Delphi, who've worked with me almost every single day for their tenacity uh, their battle to make sure that this egregious wrong is righted. And I just want to say one last thing before I leave. I want to say thank you to Coach Perlmutter for your service. It's been great to, great to work with you. And uh, sorry I didn't get to play this year, but I just want to say thank you. You're terrific and uh, really enjoyed working with you. And uh, thank you, for, uh, th thank you for, doing, for doing the battle on uh, your previous comments earlier. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to uh, hopefully getting this back in. And I thank you again for your time. I know this is time is of the essence and I don't want to take any more, but Thank you to all of you for serving in this, and I yield back. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let, me th let me thank you all for your testimony. Rep Representative Tenney, I, you know, we are in a, we're at the end of a, uh, oh, do you want to go, all right. Well, okay, we, I'm, we have to go to Mr. Perlmutter before we get to questions, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you heard of most of what I wanted to say concerning the salaries. I'd like to introduce a few things into the record. Um, Mr. Chairman, the case of Bob Schaefer versus Bill Clinton, uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, 240 F. 3rd, uh, dated 
February 13, 2001, in which case um, Congressman Schaefer at that time objected to cost of living adjustments. Uh, the court ruled him out of order that uh, he, uh, that the cost of living adjustments that he had gotten did not injure him. He did not have standing when he, when he uh, uh, got, received the cost of living. He had opposed the cost of living. He got it, and they said he wasn't injured by getting Without the cost of living. Second is uh, the famous case of Boehner versus Anderson. Uh, John Boehner, in uh, 30F's third 156, United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, objected to cost of living uh, adjustments offered under the Ethics Reform Act of 1989. And in that particular case, the court uh, disagreed with them and said that the cost of living adjustments were appropriate, that they had been uh, offered by Congress uh, appropriately. Finally, uh, what I was talking about, the last one, is the case of Beer versus the United States. Uh, it's an appeal to the United States Court of Appeals uh, for the uh, Federal Circuit, so for, again, for the D.C. Circuit. And in that case, uh, some of you may remember, in 2009, we started the, down this path of denying ourselves um, COLAs. And at that time, our salary and the judge's salaries were coupled. And we were at the same level, and we were both entitled to cost of living adjustments. We said, we're not going to take any cost of living adjustments, and you judges cannot take any cost of living adjustments. The court, under the Ethics Reform Act of uh, 1989, said no. It's a very precise, mechanical, automatic adjustment and the Congress can't just deny it for two reasons. One, the, you got to basically repeal the Ethics Reform Act. And two, you can't vary a judge's compensation uh, during their term of office. You can't decrease it. And they said by not giving a cost of living adjustment, you were causing the judge's salaries to decrease. And we know now uh, that we, so we, the Congress, lost that lawsuit. The judges were reinstated. They got back pay. And they will start, as of January 1st, at 233000 for U.S. district judges. For circuit judges, it's like two sixty, And for the Supreme Court, it's about three hundred. And so had we stayed equal, that's where we would be uh, with, with those judges. Now... I'm offering also for the record uh, an article from the Washington Post, Why It's Easier to Serve in Congress When You're Rich. Uh, that's dated October 7, 2022. Um, a, an article from Yahoo Money from the November 18th, the employers plan largest raises since 2007 because of recent inflation. And finally, uh, the young man from Florida, uh, Maxwell Frost, who has been struggling to find housing here uh, on a going forward basis. So I'd like to, to introduce those Without objection. Uh, cases and those matters for the record. Now, I've got three, I've got three amendments that I would propose, and I'm going to offer and withdraw them, but I want to discuss them briefly. And I don't know if this panel needs to stay. <laughs> yeah, so, so in all likelihood, we, 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 we probably will do the markup. Oh, so I can decide. You, you, what? Oh, yeah, you can, you can talk about them right now, but we're not, we're not going to. Yeah, we don't have a. Okay. Yeah, but, but you can, right, you, well, if you want to. I can describe my. You can describe them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, he, yeah, he heard me say withdraw, so yeah, that's yeah. why he wants to jump on this very quickly. <laughs> Which is fair. I'm, I'm with it. So the first, and this is what I could not find when I lost it there, but this uh, bill uh, on page 6, page 5, lines 20 through 20, uh, page, uh, through line 2 on page 6, notwithstanding any other provision of law, no adjustment shall be made under section 601 of the Legislative Reorganization Act to cost of living adjustments. So... First, my first amendment would strike that section. 
and we would be entitled to at least a cost of living adjustment. We're, I, we're already entitled, and I'll explain that in my second amendment, uh, for this prior year. The second amendment that I would propose is entitled the 27th Amendment Enforcement Act. So the 27th Amendment says we cannot vary our compensation without an intervening election. So, and it was primarily thinking that Congress was going to give itself raises, but it uses the word vary, not increase, but vary. So similar logic to what happened to the judges is happening to us. And we know that between 2009 and today, we're $58,000 to the, to the red, if you will. So the 174000 that I was earning back in 2009 is more like 120000 today. And the argument in this bill is that we have not constitutionally provided for us pursuant to the 27th Amendment. The third amendment that I would offer is one that just returns us to being uh, tied with the judges. Now, I don't think the judges are being paid enough, but that's a whole other story that the Judiciary Committee should take up. But that, the third one uh, would be to put us back on a par with the federal judges. Uh, those would be what I offered. The final thing, the final amendment I was going to offer is to offer uh, safe banking again uh, for the eighth time to send over to the, Cong to the United States Senate. And with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Let me thank everybody for your testimony. And Ms. Tenney, I, um, I'm very supportive of your effort. And, um, and, you know, we are at the end of a process here that uh, we don't have a lot of choices um, to open this up without derailing everything at this point. It's just a, kind of where we're at. But you have my, um, my word that I'll continue to work with you on that. And Ms. Cram, Ms. Garcia, I mean, I, I, am, I share your frustration and your outrage that uh, we could not attach the omnibus-related legislation um, language that would provide stability and peace of mind uh, for the Dreamers as well as for longtime TPS holders. Uh, and for our migrant agricultural workers. Um, and um, I'm, I regret that, that there was no provision included, uh, you know, uh, that uh, allowed for the Afghan Adjustment Act uh, to, be, uh, to be put into law. And uh, the House has passed all these measures. I even suspect with the, even with the change in the majority here in the House, the tight margins, uh, if we are able to bring any of these bills to the floor again in the House, we probably may have the votes to pass them again. Um, and we have to figure out how to deal with our, with our Senate problem. But it's, it's just, I mean, I think about what the Dreamers have contributed to this country, what the TPS holders have contributed to this country. I go right down the list. I mean, and that this is how we, how we repay them. And um, so, um, you know, I think to everyone who believes that it is long time passed to fix these and other matters in our broken immigration system, uh, I think we just have to keep on fighting until we, uh, until we succeed. Uh, but it is a lost opportunity uh, here to, that uh, we're not taking care of tens of millions of immigrants who for decades have been fully integrated into our communities and in the case of Afghans are about, you know, are about to be. So uh, shame on all of us for having failed to do so. Um, and. Um, so, uh, in any event, and Mr. Perlmutter, uh, you know, on adequate compensation, I, I agree with you. Obviously, it is tough to get a majority here to want to move on that. But on the Safe Banking Act, uh, I mean, um, you have so, you know, imprinted in our brains uh, <laughs> that legislation that um, even in your absence, we will continue to offer uh, those amendments. Uh, because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. You know, I've had people come up to me, um, you know, who run cannabis businesses who say that, uh, you know, because people can't use credit cards, because people can't use checks, people wait in line with lots of cash. I mean, there's a public safety issue here. And it makes no sense. If states have already moved ahead, 
why is it taking so long for the federal government to make the necessary adjustments so that these businesses can operate it like any other business? And we will get there, um, I hope, sooner rather than later. But anyway, I appreciate everybody being here. I'm going to yield to Mr. Cole. Just very quickly um, on the, the issue of DACA, I still think there is a, a border security trade-off uh, with, you know, a path to citizenship for DACA people, and uh, yeah, or DACA people seems like an impersonal phrase for people caught in this situation uh, through no fault of their own. Uh, and so, you know, I, I would hope that deal has been offered several occasions by people on both sides, quite frankly. Uh, and it, I'm mystified why we haven't done it. I think we missed a big opportunity uh, actually back in 2017 uh, when that deal was on the table. I think it was actually advanced by, uh, by uh, Leader Schumer uh, to try and do something. So uh, to me, that's, that's the way forward on that, and uh, we ought to do that. I agree with you 100 percent on the Afghan situation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are people that were friends and allies and supporters of the United States, uh, uh, the appropriate thing to do. Obviously, it was to uh, let them in this country and now make sure they have the opportunity to integrate into this country fully. Uh, and um, I, I look forward to working with you that. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter, uh, I was awake down here. Uh, you know, I was just closing my eyes and, and praying that your amendment would be made in order. So <laughs> I just want you to know I agree with what you're trying to do and appreciate the fact that you're trying to do it, quite frankly. And um, understand the problems that the, the chairman's laid out in terms of the legislation we're dealing with, but your fingers on the problem, and, and it really does get down to, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how people that arrive here in their 30s that have not had the chance to be successful financially before they got here stay here. If you've got kids and you're trying to buy a home and you're trying to maintain up here, I think most people assume we get per diem things like that. So, I, I, again, I agree with what you're trying to do and, and hope. Uh, I know uh, our distinguished majority leaders certainly worked hard to try and find common ground and do that. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people are appropriately critical of former Speaker Hastert, but it happened every year when he was here, every single year for eight years in a row. And, uh, unfortunately, my friends in the minority decided to make that a campaign issue and broke the deal, and everybody's been afraid to touch it since. Uh, and uh, the only way that will happen is if the two parties, you know, hold hands and said this should not be a political issue. We should follow the rulings that you laid out, uh, and uh, I hope we do at some point, because I do think qualitatively over time it will impact who can serve, and um, we'll, we'll, you know, that's just not fair. Uh, that's, uh, and it's going to deny us some important voices and some important talent. You know, I, I note... Um, and there's, I'm sure, a variety of reasons for this, but it hasn't been all that long since we've been in the majority, and uh, we're obviously going into it again, and yet over half of our members have never served in the majority on the Republican side. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for the exodus is exactly what you point to, uh, you know, not just the opportunities, but it's, hey, I've got to think about my kids and my spouse and uh, and uh, my future, and we lose a lot of good members that are forced to make those kind of very difficult personal and family decisions. So I think it's a very serious issue. Finally, you even finally beat me into submission on safe banking, and I voted for that uh, every time, uh, or multiple times. And I think uh, my friend, the chairman's right. Uh, whether I agreed with legalization or not, I talked to too many law enforcement professionals and uh, and. Uh, people in the financial services industries, and they tell me about the hardships that this creates and, frankly, the opportunities uh, uh, for criminals because they know these are cash-heavy enterprises and the difficulties that uh, can be associated with money laundering. Uh, you know, all those things would be improved enormously if we passed your legislation. So I, I hope we do take that up. And finally, uh, Ms. Tenney, I, I, I agree this is just an unfair case. This is, uh, I'm proud the House acted and acted in a bipartisan fashion on that legislation. I'm sure Mr. Turner and Mr. Kildee will introduce it again. I think it will uh, get broad bipartisan support here. I'm mystified uh, why it can't move in the United States Senate. I have no idea as to why, but I think that the, the case is so obvious and so unfair 
that uh, people simply because they weren't unionized members were excluded from protections that we gave to other folks that were. And uh, I, I, I don't know why that can't be dealt with, but I'm sure the effort will renew itself, and I know you'll be here to help it. And uh, as you do, I think you're going to have a lot of bipartisan support, as was demonstrated this year. So these are all, again, I understand the, the chairman's uh, uh, exactly right. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. We have a lot of big decisions to make, so I don't quibble with that. Uh, but I thank each of you for bringing these issues up. Uh, I think they're important to plant the seeds. If we can't get it done this year, we ought to be looking at figuring out ways to get it done next year. And again, I see all these things as essentially bipartisan, uh, and perhaps the narrowness of the majority may force us to work together. But we certainly ought to confront the Senate uh, with things like the Delphi uh, outrage and, and um, with common sense uh, kind of alternatives for border security and, and uh, appropriate path to citizenship for DACA people. These are uh, not a legislative problem, perhaps, but uh, I think uh, all of you on the respective amendments you've offered are on the right side of history. We just got to figure out a way to get it done. Uh, and with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Um, thank you. Maybe we can do a bipartisan resolution admitting your chair of the state. Thank you, Chair. Whoever <laughs> sits there can know that that's their job. Uh, Mrs. Torres. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and I do want to thank all of you, um, including my colleague that I will miss um, greatly. By the way, I was stranded for four and a half hours um, in Colorado just last week trying to get home. But I know. I should have called. Um, you know, I, I, I want to go back to, um, you know, the issue of um, the millions of people that are here, um, you know, the, the DACA. Um, recipients that are every single day, you know, their life is being threatened, their livelihoods are being threatened with deportation. Um, I, I do um, um, agree that there had been efforts to tie that with border security. Um, if our good friend, uh, Chairwoman Lucille Royball Allard was here, she would um, correct us and, and say, and remind us of how many times, as a chairwoman of, of the subcommittee on Homeland Security that dealt with border security, um, she has taken many, many, many votes um, that have come back to haunt her over, over this issue. Tying dreamers to border security is really immoral because these are not um, security risks for our country. These, were pe these are people that came to the United States as young people. If they were criminals, if um, they had some kind of background issue, they would have been deported, as many of them are deported because they have a DUI or whatever. Um, so we can't tie people that are American in every way, um, except on paper, to the issues that we have at the border. Um, so I just want to be clear about that, and I want to ask um, uh, Ms. Garcia if she has anything to add on that issue, because you know this is your amendment. Well, thank you for the question. And all I'll say is this, it, you know, as I think Mr. Laura mentioned, or maybe it was the chairman, that there was uh, $3 billion in the Homeland Security portion appropriations for border security. So to me, it is being covered. It is on the table. And it is separate and apart from anything that comes out of my committee. And his com we're both on judiciary. We're both on the subcommittee. If they were tied together, then it would be one committee hearing both things. But it's not, because they're separate. Uh, so you're absolutely right. And it's not only the federal government. You know, I come from Texas. We're ground zero in many of these issues, or non-issues, depending on your point of view. When I was a state senator, we were spending about $845 million on border security. The state of Texas, you know what it is now? Close to $5 billion. Lots of money down there. I mean, I have seen the charts. I have seen the maps of the different layers of security, everything from the people on the ground to the boats to the airplanes to the drones to the helicopters. I mean, I'm not sure what else more we can do 
other perhaps smarter technology and smarter ways to, to uh, with x-ray and, and uh, other cameras to try to, to see what's coming through, particularly when it comes to fentanyl uh, in packages and containers and cars. Because the people that are coming through seeking refugee here in our country are not the bad guys. They're not, it's mostly women and children. Mm -hmm. So I think we already have a lot of dollars on border security, and we have all voted for some of those dollars. So to me, it's, it's always seemed like a red herring. Well, yes, but it's gotta come with border security. Well, we are doing a lot on border security, but we're not doing anything for the dreamers. And that's, and we'll keep fighting. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Um, you look like you wanna add something to that. Uh, You're on Homeland Security on that subcommittee. And uh, I concur with uh, Congresswoman Garcia. Uh, the amounts of money that's spent on the border uh, and border security, we don't talk about border security. It doesn't start and begin with the border. Uh, most of the terrorists that are caught are actually caught on the northern border. The real bad guys are actually caught places like the Brazil airport because that's the easiest place for the escapers. And I do hope that we can have this discussion, but a discussion driven by the facts and what it is to have a secure America, which is not really talking about immigration reform. This is a different matter, but nonetheless, we'll continue to spend money on border security. Uh, and again, as Ms. Garcia said, if it's about fentanyl, 90%, 95% of that stuff goes through the border checkpoints better technology to stop that poison that comes to our country. Absolutely agree. But also agree that our economy needs immigrants. Afghanis should be in this country. Ukrainians, okay. We did it right with the Ukrainians. Lifted 42, said come on in with a TPS program. We should learn from that lesson. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's uh, plenty I could say about this, but in the interest of time, I'm I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Um, was it from Mario Del Cerro? Uh, thank the panel for your testimony. Obviously, the DACA stuff is long overdue getting resolved. The, the issue that you brought up, Ms. Penny, we should have taken care of that a long time ago. Same year. Yes. 2009. Yes. So I just add two things to the record. Um, in that beer case I talked about for the judges, um, there's a, it says the depend dependable COLA system became, quote, final important part of the package designed to remove salaries from their current vulnerability for political demagoguery. That was a quote from a colleague from years back, Vic Fazio, uh, when he talked about the Ethics <coughs> Reform Act. So I just want to mention that. And then the 27th Amendment, says no law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. And so that's the, the basis for, you, you gotta wait, whether it goes up or down, you, you, we haven't done it properly. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. With no objection, those will be entered to the record. Uh, Mr. Reshmethal, uh, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to express my appreciation for um, Mr. Correa and Ms. Garcia and their advocacy for um, young people in DACA. Um, you know, this is something we should have dealt with a long time ago. I think it's unconscionable what we've put all these young people through. I mean, you know, I've got a number of constituents who work as nurses, they work as teachers, they're firefighters, um, and I just feel like we've treated them so poorly, um, you know, in this political tug of war, and, uh, that, you know, I wish we could uh, just get through this. So I want to thank my colleagues for their great advocacy on this, and I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Fishbach. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I... Uh, just want to take a moment. I, first of all, I appreciate the panelists and those who offered amendments. I certainly appreciate 
Mr. Perlmutter, but I, I wanted to just take a moment if I can, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. I've had the great privilege of serving uh, on this committee now for four years. It seems like uh, just a few minutes in some ways. And I remember when I first became a member of this committee, people warning me, oh, you're on rules, boy. Uh, you're not going to like that. Well, I have enjoyed every single moment of this, uh, the time with all of you. I feel like it's a uh, uh, a large, at times unruly family, but uh, I have learned so much from members on both sides of the aisle. I have uh, the deepest respect and affection and um, gratitude to you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Cole, uh, who I've uh, equally learned a great deal from, and from each of the members of this committee. Uh, it's just been a great privilege to serve with all of you, and I did want to also acknowledge my buddy, uh, Perlmutter, who uh, uh, has took an interest in me for reasons I don't really understand, but from the moments I got here and has been a great friend and mentor and each of these members, I, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to serve with you. And um, I don't know what the future will hold, but I uh, just want to say uh, uh, for the record, how, uh, how great it's been to be a member of the rules committee. I'm very, very proud of it. And I uh, just want to acknowledge your leadership and, uh, the leadership of every single member who I've had the privilege to serve with. I yield back. Well, thank you very much. We are a family. We're the, like the Adams family, but we are the, we are the fa <laughs> our family. But uh, uh, Mr. Desagne, <laughs> Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll associate myself with the comments of all of the members um, about the, the merits of the proposals that have been brought forward. I also really want it. She's not here, but I want to give a shout out to um, Chairwoman Zoe Lofgren, who put together the American Dream and Promise Act, which took care of the Dreamers, TPS, the Documented Dreamers, and got bipartisan support in this House, and also the Farm Worker Modernization Act. Both of these were needed pieces of legislation, bipartisan legislation, and hopefully will be the framework for what we can do in the next session. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, does any other member have any questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you so much. You are free to Chair, go. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Um, um, are there any other members who wish to testify on Senate Amendment to H.R. 2617? Seeing none, that closes the hearing. Uh, on uh, Senate Amendment to HR 2617. <laughs> so, without objection, the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. So, I, I, 